Now, the World Bank Group has identified corruption as a major challenge to its twin goal of ending extreme poverty by 2030 and boosting shared prosperity for the poorest 40% of the people in developing countries. That's why concerted efforts fighting corruption still remains a tough job in Africa, where top politicians, including heads of government and their acolytes, seek to corner public resources to fund personal enterprises. Now, joining us to discuss how African nations could effectively tackle endemic corruption so as to free more funds for development is Francis Kaifala, Commissioner of the Anti-Corruption Commission of the Republic of Sierra Leone. I want to say thank you very much and welcome to Newsday. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. Yes. Um, corruption seems to be, Everywhere. some would claim. Everywhere. Seems to be interwoven into the fabric of Africa. And we've had people speak against it. Now the question is this. Where do we start from? Understanding that corruption, as some would claim, some, some, some sociologists would claim that corruption cannot be fully eradicated. But where do we start from in reducing corruption in our institutions? I think the starting point should be identify those things that every country considers to be corruption, mm -hmm. clearly distinguishing them from acceptable practices and making sure that action is taken against those that are unacceptable. So corruption in one country is different from corruption in another country? There are cultural dimensions, there are social dimensions, there are traditional dimensions. If you take a a one formula fit all approach, you may miss certain important points. So the most important thing is ensuring that the country takes into consideration its own system and clearly identify what it accepts and does not accept and punishes that which it accepts or otherwise sets in motion prevention measures to avoid them. So obviously punishment or justice is a very important uh, part of the process in, in this whole corruption situation. Of course, sanctions are very important. So in a country where it might be hard to get justice or justice is delayed, denied, or justice is an issue, um, how, how is it even possible to go about dismantling um, the uh, tentacles of corruption? I think, as again, it comes again to the country wanting it to mm -hmm. go away and taking steps. So, for example, in Sierra Leone, what we have done to navigate the justice problem is to set up a special division of the high court Okay. where corruption cases do not have to pile up behind land cases, other criminal cases, where they can be tried faster and judgment is delivered faster. Um, that moved our case clogs to uh, uh, the time frame for completing cases to move from probably six years or three years on average to now six months or three months or even one month on average. So these are all, we have to look at it from the problem. We all have to accept that Clogging of the justice system is part of the problems of fighting corruption in Africa and to take decisive action and steps that can navigate it because we have to understand that really corruption is a serious problem on the continent and we cannot continue to be uh, bemoaning the problem without really seeking solutions to it. And the justice system is one of them. And there's a direct approach set up a tribunal distinct from other tribunals treated to the seriousness it deserves. All right. Um, I watched a documentary about drug trade, for example. Yeah. Let's try to mirror it to corruption now because... Um, the question was the question that was being posed mm -hmm. to those fighting um, the the illegal production of drugs in Colombia, for example, mm -hmm. were claiming that there are no there are not enough social programs to help people as a means of law of substitution, substituting one for another. That you say stop doing this and do this, but the fact that there is a big vacuum by the government almost makes it impossible for you to read a nation of corruption, so No, to speak. The, the people who engage in corruption have clear means of substitution. There are people who are employed in high office. There are people who have jobs. There are decision makers. There are policy makers. There are people who take decisions on taxes, on um, licenses, and things like that. They are the ones who divert funds, so I cannot understand the context. So are you saying, drugs. are we just talking about corruption at the highest level? Or are we talking about corruption we that are is talking, systemic? We are talking about public service corruption okay. that is systemic. Okay. Yes. Public service corruption now. Yes, yeah, so we are not talking about corruption in private life where two people are cheat themselves. That is really between them. They can go to court and get justice. But is that not what translates to public corruption ultimately? I think that all these things are product of society. Yes, that one is important. But if you are talking about the corruption that World Bank is really referring to is mm. converting public resources to private benefit. So that is slightly different from those kinds of corruption 
which is really behavioral, which can be approached by other means in terms of educating the public and getting to create a more enlightened and educated citizenry who understand that this honesty is unacceptable and they do things about it. And that goes way to the background, to schools, to how they are trained, to families, churches and mosques and things like that. But what we do, for example, in our field, when we say we are fighting corruption, is really about public service corruption because that is the one that destroys the fabric of the nation. That is the one that is diverting that which should benefit the people to personal gain. So uh, the, the personal become more, imp more important than the collective. So that is really the focus and that is the niche which we have and every country in Africa has to focus on. So it pretty much starts with a reorientation of the basic citizen and hopefully trickles all the way up. Um, and we're talking about large scale corruption, so looting of public funds. Are there any other examples apart from Sierra Leone, which, which you're um, from, uh, of countries who have been able to stamp down or cut down on oh, yeah, corruption by implementing certain programs? And if so, which programs are those? So for example, you have the classical case of Botswana, which okay. really has very minimal corruption, probably the third less corrupt country in Africa. You also have Rwanda, where really there are systems that are working in terms of preventing corruption. You have Seychelles, you have Mauritius. Mauritius and Seychelles are, because of their size, it's easy to put in place measures that can defeat corruption. And there, there are other countries like Ivory Coast, Senegal, who are also doing their best. So really, it's, it's a question of taking conscientious steps. And one of the good things that is happening in Africa, almost every country now has an outfit responsible. Gambia was the last country really that needed to set up that. And they are doing so now. They are coming to Sierra Leone on the 25th. I'm going to meet with them. And they want to set up their own anti-corruption commission and they want to take best practices from across Africa, which they can take back to Gambia and then implement. So um, we have to start from the beginning. Get the system, get people, get the laws, get the rules, get the political will to back it up, and then the courage to go after whosoever is engaged in corruption. There we can see what happens. These things have not happened in countries like Botswana. They have not happened in Rwanda just because of magic, not because of prayer. It's because people took action against them. Well said. Okay. Um, what does the role of self-preservation in terms of, because some people, some people usually narrow um, corruption to, of public officials, one to greed and the other is to almost try to preserve their future and saying that now that I've gotten into this public office and I've gotten access to this amount of funds, I don't want to ever be poor again. So I want to take as much as I can to ensure that my family, my family, family, family do not ever get to suffer like I did. What rule, what can we do to ensure that we begin to change that perspective? I think um, for those of us who believe in the science of evolution know that the human tendency is greedy. We want to have everything to ourselves. So if you look at a typical ape community which is credited for where we inherited a lot of our natural instincts from is to have all the wives, have all the resources, and the, 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 the patriarch sleeps, and the women and children kill everything, and he comes and eats, and what he leaves is what they eat. So those are the things that come. But society has to move beyond that. Society has to put in place policies and measures to control and suppress human greed. Mm -hmm. So that self-preservation you're talking about is exactly what should not be in public service. Public service is about serving the people. It's about resources that are collectively owned. So where you have a situation where somebody occupies a space and wants to keep everything to preserve himself so his children can go to the best schools, so they can get medical care when there's needed, instead of ensuring that these things are available to the public space, that is the problem. And the best way to do it is rules that prevent it and action taken clearly and distinctively against those who do it. You set an example, she spoke about the beginning about sanctions. You make sure that psychologically people understand that there are consequences for their action. So the formula to reading a country of corruption, for example, is to make it expensive. You make it a high risk and a low return venture. So nobody benefits from it and it's also risky for you to engage into it. You could be caught and if you are caught, there are clear sanctions that could apply to you, including embarrassment, including your name being in newspapers, including your family name being brought into disrepute and of course imprisonment. So these are things that should happen to suppress human instinct because we are always greedy. We want everything for ourselves. We want to eat everything for ourselves. We want to sleep and wake up and not even walk but get money. It is the rules that society puts in place to support this greed that is most important than anything else. 
I'm wondering if you meet with um, other countries, uh, if there's any kind of national conference, for lack of a better way to describe it, like a conference for the discussion of the best practices on how to handle corruption uh, culturally by each country. Is there something that, that, like that that happens? And have you ever met with our own Nigerian um, Yes, we have. Corruption. Every year we have what we call the African Anti-Corruption Dialogue centered around certain team. There is one happening just around the 11th, I believe, by the African Union, where we really discuss issues like that, depending on the team. Some years it's about the difficulty in accessing justice in the anti-corruption fight. Sometimes it's about other things. And culture plays a very important role in all of this. Sometimes it's about resources. If an institution is there to fight corruption and it's not well resourced, how do you expect it to go against the powerful and things like that? Even the lawyers that they are capable of hiring sometimes have more resources and they are better trained than the lawyers that the institution can hire because at the end of the day it's about money. Lawyers have to be well paid for them to be willing to work for such institutions. So these are conversations that we have all the time. And um, the Network of Anti-Corruption Institution, of which I am the president, which includes Nigeria, we are having our conference, conference sometime in November in Nigeria. And some of the conversations we have, including borderless uh, investigations, illicit flow of wealth to other countries, but also really the challenges that we all face in our field and how we can collectively work to navigate it. So these conversations are happening. They are happening at the United Nations, the UNODC, which is responsible for issues like corruption and fight against crime, drugs, and things like that, also has a lot of conversations around this. But I think within the African context, we really need to have a greater conversation. I know that there are books written around this, particularly when it comes to how culture plays a role in failing corruption in Africa. Uh, but um, we need to have more conversations around it so that we can be able, like I said from the beginning, identify within the context of particular countries that which is unacceptable and that which is acceptable, and then we can be able to take more action against it. Now, right. okay, lastly, let's talk about the Pandora Papers. A lot of people that were indicted by those papers claimed that some of the things they did were just... Than almost standard business practice and not necessarily corrupt practices. Where yes. do you draw that line? Because, for example, the Queen of England was indicted by those papers. Some other people were mentioned in those papers. And some of them say they have not done anything wrong, aside just probably protecting their assets. There's a difference between whistleblowing and the commission of a crime. A whistleblower can identify a lot of things wrong in society. Sometimes it's about wasteful spending. Wasteful spending is not corruption. So, for example, if your government decides to buy Mercedes-Benz for every police officer in Nigeria, uh, people may cry against it. But if it goes through proper processes and procedures and then they buy the Mercedes-Benz and give police officers, it will not be corruption because they have the power to do so. The same thing about personal investment and things like that. Some people may think that why everybody is dying of hunger in a particular country, some people are buying yachts in Monaco while living there freely. That is not corruption, but also society has to be weary of such people if they are leaders because you have to have some care. So whistleblowing really just brings out ills in society, which includes corruption. So some of it may include corruption, mm -hmm. but it will be very, very incorrect for you to classify everything that the Pandora paper says as corruption. And that is why, for example, in Sierra Leone, when the Pandora papers came out, I directed one of our departments to do a a complete comb of the papers to identify if there is anything on Sierra Leone, anyone mentioned and things like that. So we know whether it is something of interest to us. Thankfully, there was nothing on Sierra Leone. So um, that is how our report well, ended. We're still dealing with the ones in Nigeria. But, uh, <laughs> oh, yes, Francis, we are. Yes, Francis, we are. <laughs> thank you for coming into our studio. What a great discussion we had. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Uh, yes, thank you so much.